So we'll begin with, uh, with our next speaker um, with uh, some deep learning. Uh, this is Roloff. Uh, I met Roloff uh, at PyCon Sweden uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, they're on uh, the data science track. Um, and I'm really happy that uh, I managed to recruit several of the data science speakers. Uh, so Roloff uh, and Hendrik uh, and Juan, who I think may have just spoken. Um, so um, there's no harm in stealing speakers from other conferences and dragging them to yours uh, when they've got interesting content to talk about. Uh, so uh, Roloff runs the deep learning uh, user group in Sweden, that's right, yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and is an academic, uh, and so has lots of deep insights into uh, the field of deep learning, uh, which we'll hear about now. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ian, for, for kidnapping me from cold Sweden. Um, so yeah, let's start off. So this was the, the proposed title of my talk, but then I found out there's a lot of people already doing the language uh, side of things, so I decided to focus a bit more uh, on instead uh, the image part. A uh, bit less pretentious, but, but still nice, I hope. Uh, and also it allows me basically to focus a bit more on, on the, the actual fact, fact what, like what is deep learning in, a, in the most basic form, like wh what is all the hype about. Uh, and also if you want to you know, get started with this kind of new trend of, of machine learning, like what are kind of things to take care of. Uh, so we'll start with a, with a short introduction of like what deep learning is, where it comes from, etc. Uh, and then I will switch over to some practical advice uh, using Python to, to train your, your deep neural nets for computer vision, for some image tasks, uh, and how to optimize them once, once you're there. So first of all, what is deep learning, which is immediately uh, heavily debated. So, so one of the most used definitions is that it's a, a set of algorithms in machine learning that attempts to learn multiple levels of, of features um, in which correspond to multiple levels of abstraction. So this is kind of the core, I think, and it connects to uh, once you have machine learning, there's something in between machine learning and deep learning, which we call uh, representational learning. And representational learning is kind of the, the discipline in science where we think about like, what is the best way to, to construct knowledge, and once we have knowledge, how to represent it in our machine learning models. Uh, and usually how we, how we, at least like machine learning uh, disciples have done this through many years, is um, handcrafting features, feature engineering, uh, and many, many years uh, of, our, of our, not mine, I'm relatively young, but many of my colleagues, at least at uh, the, the KTH University where I'm at, at Sweden, have made a, you know, a big career in handcrafting features for audio, for language, for, for whatever. Uh, and we've been doing that for, for relatively uh, you know, large successes with gradual increase uh, in, in accuracy and uh, decrease in error rates, exactly. Uh, but then deep learning came along and kind of blasted all of that away. So. Deep learning um, basically means neural networks. Um, there's other ways how we can do this, but generally mean we have neural networks and we stack multiple levels of, of neural networks together. Uh, and yeah, this has mostly been started since 2006, where we, two papers came out, uh, how to solve the mystery of going beyond the three layers once you stack neural networks on top of each other. Uh, it used to be not really possible to go further than three layers. So it basically was just, like an SVM, which also have like this kind of three levels of non-regularities where you can say you have data, I want to do transformations on the data to be able to predict labels, and I can do this in a, in a certain complexity, so, so, so information can be of a certain complexity level to make sense of it. And SVM was kind of state of the art, and also the easiest to use, uh, and even more important, much more uh, performance-wise, much better choice than neural networks. So SVM rules, neural networks were not really used much, but there were some guys still continuing their neural network research, uh, and especially around 2006 and onwards when it was kind of found out how GPUs especially could be used uh, to, to, to run these programs, and there was more data available, labeled data. When these kind of two things collided, it's, it's when deep learning kind of took off. Um, so. Basically what I said is that, that what, what is then the kind of good things about this new trend in machine learning, deep learning. So um, what I would say is one of the, the, the biggest troubles with uh, handcrafted features and manual engineered features is that they're overspecified. You create them for you know, your domain or for your data set, but once you've created them, you can't really adapt them to other domains. So they're very domain specific. They're also very brittle. Uh, and, and you just keep investing more and more time in these things without at some point getting much of a return. At some point you hit the level of your models and you can't really do much more. Um, 
where, on the other hand, learned features, which deep learning is about, that you actually outsource this hand feature engineering to machines. You say, well, computer, come up with features for me. I don't really care uh, what it is, but uh, I trust you that you know what you're doing. Uh, these are really easy to adapt and very fast to learn as well, uh, and also have some kind of universal representability that it can be used both for audio and text and vision, uh, even in, in the same model. So you can train one model which can do amazing things on all kinds of different domains. Um, and that's kind of, of course, the dream of, of hard AI, at least a step in that direction, having a brain-like model which can do all these kind of things. Uh, and then mostly when we talk about deep learning, there's two different stages. One is the unsupervised stage, where we, where we kick off our, our deep neural networks. We train our, our deep nets, as it's called, on a large amount of data. And this is kind of the trick, mostly unlabeled data. So you get a kind of generative model, generative machine learning model, which starts to kind of get a good idea about what data consists of. And then you fine tune the model with some supervised step where you have labels for something. Uh, but that's kind of the, the, the trick. So best of all, no more handcrafted features, which I think is, is it's kind of key, and it lets us focus on uh, some more interesting things. It has, of course, some, some side effects as well, maybe losing domain knowledge and things like this, but, uh, but I will focus on this, so this is not actually really true. Um, so if we talk about hierarchical features, what do we really mean? So deep learning is basically inspired by the brain. It's very much unlike the brain. It's a very simple version of the brain, but it kind of works. This is, I think this is a nice metaphor, at least, how these things work. So we have neurons in, in, in the brain, and what is represented here is the brain. You have your neural visual cortex, which basically is how you see the world, you know, through your eyes. Uh, and in your brain, the closest to your, to your vision, you have, you know, very simple edge detectors. So what you see the closest to your brain, so it's a few milliseconds, you see only sh sides of shapes. And these sides of shapes together can be combined in a kind of higher level, and neurons further away in your brain, so further away as a time step, kind of make use of these other kind of neurons to kind of construct these things together. And it becomes kind of gradually keep using each other in a hierarchical fashion. So this is how the brain operates. Um, and taking this as a kind of as a biological inspiration is what kicked off uh, deep learning. So of course, this is more how it looks as deep learning. And so we have very simplistic versions of neurons, which can be just zero or one, or basically one, any value between um, zero and one. And this is actually the internal representation of a network trained on uh, faces. So this is actually all these filters, what you see here, our inputs are actually what the neurons have learned to represent. So we can see here um, in the most uh, down layer, we see the edges. Combining those together, we get some intermediary representations, which are, you know, eyes or noses. Using those together, we get to the faces. Uh, so this is pretty neat, and, and the cool thing is that using the same architecture and the same IDs, you can actually use this for, you know, other domains, like use it for audio or, or for text, etc. Um, and depending on what we throw in, the same network learns to represent different objects in this similar fashion. So it can represent cars, elephants, chairs, all in this kind of hierarchical fashion. Um, so basically what this has done for, for, for science and also for industry, um, it's mostly easily seen with the kind of um, audio, bit different competitions in science which have been taking place. So for the first time in 2009, we see here the, the orange-like spheres here are the deep learning models. Uh, and before that, it was all kind of other kinds of audio-based models. Uh, MFCCs and, and stuff like this, which were mostly used for this kind of signal processing. Um, and in 2009, we saw that for the first time this deep learning model was used, uh, and it was immediately a kind of reduction. And since then, it has been only deep learning models, which have been reducing the error rate large, uh, which also caused kind of um, the, the audio, whatever you would call it, audio industry to take over this model and adopt them for, for industry use as well. Uh, and this is now, for instance, in 2012, Google already adopted deep learning in its um, uh, Android speed search. So if you search your Android, you know, you talk to your Android to give me, you know, wherever I can go to a pub, well, then you're actually talking to a deep learning network. Uh, and Siri does the same. Uh, Skype has been doing the same for its instant translation from Spanish and back again, uh, et cetera. And the same is true for uh, image, computer vision-based approaches, where in 2012, um, the, the network uh, AlexNet basically reduced the error rate by 40%. Uh, so all the other models were not deep learning models, but the orange one like beat them all very much. 
And since then, again, it has been only deep neural networks, uh, mostly convolutional neural networks, which I will focus more on. Um, and this also has meant that big companies like Google, Facebook have been hunting down academics who are working in these areas to kind of take them into their research labs. Uh, and it also has meant that a lot of the actual research is not so much happening anymore in academia, but actually in research centers of these big, large uh, companies, uh, for, for good or worse, whatever you might think of it. Uh, that's kind of what has been going on. Um, so, am I still on time? Yes, I think so. So, this is one of the earliest pictures from the ImageNet competition uh, for the paper published 2010, but ImageNet competition 2012. So these are the, the outputs of a, a deep neural network, a convolutional network. So the inputs, the tests, are the images. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we can also see that even if the, the network is kind of off, uh, which we can see here, and for instance in the, well, the, the grill, the, apparently it's a grill, different type of car. Uh, it's, it's wrongly classified as a convertible. But even in its kind of wrong predictions, it's still kind of sensible. It's sensible predictions, which is very different from uh, other machine learning approaches where you, know, you can be either correct or wrong. And if the model is wrong, then it's always like really, really off. There's no implicit or intuitive sense that it kind of really, really makes sense. Well, whereby these things, they're all kind of correct-ish. And you hope, of course, that it's really correct. Uh, but a lot of times also, you want your machine learning models not to be they don't really have to be 100% correct for a lot of your products you're building. You want them to be intuitively correct. So e even if it's not 100% correct, which mostly deep learning models, they, they are much better. Even if they wouldn't be, it's still intuitively, it's much better. Um, so what else is going on with deep learning? Uh, there have been people trying to use um, existing other machine learning approaches like reinforcement learning, uh, company DeepMind, which probably most of you have heard of. Uh, here from, from London, actually, uh, published a paper playing Atari with deep reinforcement learning. Uh, and I will basically show uh, one of their earliest versions of what they have done, which is they trained a model uh, using just the input of an Atari game, so just pure pixels, with an optimization function saying, well, there is a score related to whatever random stuff you throw out, so you can control um, you know, whatever you can control in the game. And all I want you to do is optimize the score. And of course, it does like random shit, and it really doesn't make sense. But after some iterations, it starts to figure out the rules by itself. And it starts to kind of lear learn these features, if you will, to understand the game. Um, so that's what we'll hopefully see here. If I have sound as well. No, no sound. Yeah, I have a separate. OK, we don't have sound, so I will pretend uh, well, what is going on? So we can see, at least here, there is a the breakout, I think it's called. It says after a few iterations, uh, it doesn't make much sense. After 120 minutes of trading, it, uh, it can control the lever much more. So at least the ball, it, it doesn't really drop down anymore. So it can just keep playing uh, already much better than a human would. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be able to do it with this speed. And after 240 minutes of trading, it finds out what are the hacks to optimize the score. And it can do these crazy things which humans <laughs> would never think of. So it knows it has to go through the top side too. Uh, so that's basically combining this kind of reinforcement learning of how babies also learn by doing, trying things and saying, well, this is good, this is bad. Uh, and then there's been other kind of interesting things which combine image representations with text representations, which are a bit based on these um, word embeddings, which I know Hendrik will also be talking about. Uh, so combining those two things together you can actually get good, accurate descriptions of what is in the image, not just as a, as a, as a one label, but actually as grammatically correct. So you get image captions. And so this is one of these approaches. Uh, and it can even like, have more and more complex things. But I won't, I won't spoil Hendrik's presentation by showing too much of this. Um, um, and then there's some other newer things. One of the new hot topics is, of course, video classifications. If you take this kind of neural networks, which are um, convolutional neural nets for recognizing images, and you take some other architecture, which are called recurrent neural networks, which are mostly used nowadays for, for uh, natural language processing, which in essence is just a time series in disguise, right? Language, you know, words after words, there's a word order. Um, the same can be done if you use this for, for videos. Uh, and one very recent published paper, uh, for instance, focused on that. 
Again, without the sound, that doesn't really matter. I will explain about pooling and other things uh, later, so don't worry about like all the different kinds of things being used. But basically what you see is that it takes frames over a time window and it updates what it thinks it's, it's seeing. Uh, so it is the top three prediction, the, so top K3 predictions. So it knows that it's obedience training for dogs somehow and it knows even that which kind of dogs are in there. Uh, different fighting. I don't know how it, how it knows that this is Sistema already from the start, but apparently it knows. <laughs> or Krav Maga. Uh, mountain unicycling. <laughs> Adventure racing. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, and so on. And this, of course, allows for, for really interesting approaches also for having, you know, much more rich interfaces where you have things that maybe news broadcasts, which you can enrich with all kinds of metadata and information. And it allows, I mean, you can imagine the kind of things this, this would allow you to do on, on, you know, any kind of visual data or video data. Uh, do you have more interesting? No, I think I will leave it to that. Um, and then, um, I think just a few days ago published uh, paper and also blog post by, by Google um, about deep neural networks. It's kind of addressing this concern about, well, we have these deep neural networks, and, but we don't really know what is going on in this you know, middle part, this black box of feature representations. But actually, we do know. Uh, we can visualize these things quite well. Um, so what they have done, they call it, uh, of course, they make some nice you know, buzzword for it. So they call it dreaming. So what does the, the network dream? You know, it sounds very nice. Um, but what we see here is that the input image is the left image, uh, and the, the, you tell the network, okay, well, predict, not predict what is on this image, but instead of giving an output on your final layers of your network, which are just, you know, like a logistical regression at the end, or some softmax classifier where you say, well, what is the, the matching label, you know, the, what is the y to the x, you say, well, in this intermediate, in your first layer, what do you think you see? So visualize what are your kind of thoughts, neural network. Uh, and what you can see is that, well, actually, it starts to con reconstruct the image by edges with the first layer does. You have an edge detector. Uh, and if you do the same for, for further away layers, so let's say one of the last layers, you get the different kinds of concepts it comes up with, which in this case, it's a cloud. So what it thinks that is most logically assumed to be in clouds are um, birds. So these are kind of birds. You can't really see it. But if you zoom in, you can see it's some kind of bird-like fashion. Um, so this basically means that you can find out more the logic reasoning of your, of your neural network, what it comes up with, and, and how does it arrive to its decisions. Uh, so it's, it's definitely still in a good direction, at least, of getting understanding of like, how do these things work. Um, then you can take it to the other level. You can say, well, we do it in different iterations. So we keep using the output image of this dreaming as the input image, and we do this over multiple iterations, and we get all kind of expressionist art. So we don't really know what is the input image anymore, but it looks pretty awesome, and this is totally constructed by um, a neural network trained on thousand classes of different kind of images, and what it knows, and recreates them. Uh, and that's kind of cool. So how does neural deep, how does deep learning work then? So we know we have neurons, which, you know, are basically quite complicated things, but if we optimize them or, or convert them to some mathematical expression, instead we get some simple formulas where we have um, an input, um, we have some weights attached to those inputs, we have some activation function in the middle, which, you know, in the most simple form here, it's a, it's a linear regression, but of course we can put in all kinds of other things, and then we have, a, have an output. Um, and this is in all the different neurons of your neural network. You have this kind of different logistic regressions or whatever you want to throw in there. Um, and one of the, the most important things to do here is to think about your activation fun function, so the things in the middle. So what do you throw in there? You want to convert um, values, mostly 0, 1, you know, if you talk about normalized pixels or between 0 and 1, to some kind of intermediate output so they can keep, you know, coming up with, with the, the stuff they like to come up with. Uh, and the earliest used function mostly is the simple sigmoid, 
which is a kind of non-linearity to convert um, like basically very continuous values to a kind of discrete value. Uh, and here you come up um, with things which are basically squashes your input to a number between 0 and 1. Um, but there's a problem that it's not zero-centered, and there's all kind of these problems that that's that I, I won't go into. So instead, then, what people have done, they come up with a, a hyperbolic tangent, and which means you squash it to between minus 1 and 1. So you allow your network to be more rich in its representation, uh, while still being you know, mathematically quite simple and fast to compute. Um, but still, it's not zero-centered, and um, it still does kind of unintended things you don't want to do, like it, it kills the gradient, the derivative, basically, of your input. Um, and this is then one of the functions mostly used. So if you want to start training neural networks, this is mostly what you'll use. Um, and it's commonly known as the rectified linear function. Um, but it's also mostly approximated, which is why it converges really fast. Like this is four to six times faster than any of the other functions. So it's basically just a, a min-max function. Um, so what do we mean when we, um, when we converge? So if we perceive you know, the output of your neural network as you know, the, the error range there, so you have your different um, error dimensions to the left, and you say, well, you start somewhere, and you take iterations, and it crawls slowly towards you know, your, your optimum minimum of your, of your error from your activation function or your loss function, um, then that's basically where you want it to end up. And this is, of course, a very simplistic version of it. <coughs> Um, but this is case the, the, the different um, optimization strategies you can take for that. So you have, which we all probably know, stochastic <laughs> gradient descent, which is one way. And then you have all this kind of uh, momentum, which you can plug in on your stochastic gradient descent to make it go a bit faster, and all these other uh, more probabilistic methods. So it's kind of first order optimization strategies. Um, so that's all for, for the theory. So I hope we're all here still with me. So. What's there for Python, then, if we want to really do some coding, which most of you probably are more interested in? So for Python, we have actually a lot of um, libraries. From most low level, we have Teano, which is uh, basically NumPy on steroids. So it can do GPU-based computations. It's heavily optimized uh, for that. Uh, Cafe, um, it has Python wrappers, but you mostly will be using the architectural layers and co for, for computer vision, mostly. Uh, and Cafe is really good in the sense that it has what they call the model zoo. So it has a lot of models which are already readily available. So kind of the winning model of the ImageNet competition or some of the more recent models like the Oxford, you know, whatever, it's all on there. So you can just download the model. And even more so, you can download the pre-trained model. So you don't have to train and spend some, some you know, a few hundred bucks on training this neural network for yourself for a few um, weeks. But you can just start with the pre-trained model to at least you know, understand what it's doing and maybe plug in some other stuff on top of it. Um, so this is one thing I've done, uh, and you can, I have a, a link at the end, so I've done, for, showed for the, the PyCon data conference, so I showed uh, the PyCon Sweden uh, conference, so I basically used one of the pre-trained models, cut off the top layer, put some new classifier on top, so I said instead of, you know, you, I want you to predict one out of the thousand different classes, I want you just to predict if something is a cat or a dog, and then, you know, took off with that, and it tr trained in one hour instead of, you know, that I have to train it on for two weeks. Uh, then there is uh, PYLearn, uh, which is a wrapper for Teano, and then there's Keras on Lasagna, which is a renewal variant, which again are also wrappers on uh, Teano. And the examples I use will be uh, Lasagna based. Um, and of course, some size guy could learn. Uh, and this is also the links. Um, so we started a bit later. I'm not sure to what time I have, Fian. Uh, you've got 10 minutes. Okay, then, then we're still good. Um, so for, for doing the deep learning, uh, if you really want the details about you know, how to do the actual coding part, I would you know, advise you to look at some other presentations or stuff. But if you have started these things, what are then kind of um, things to look at? Um, so first of all, you have your data, which you probably want to pre-process in some, some smart way. Um, you need a matching architecture, which your your you know your thing you want to do. Let's say you want to do some stuff on images. Then you have to actually train the network once you've chosen the architecture, and then you want to optimize or regularize it uh, depending on what the output is, and you want to kind of test it and get some feedbacks. So to pre-process pre the data, which with deep learning you actually want to do 
as less as possible because the more um, the more transformations you do yourself on your data, like you know using SIFT features or HOC features on your on your image data, the less you let the neural network come up with its own representation. So you want to be uh, as simple as possible with that. So the more raw the input, actually the better. Um, so what you do want to do, you want to scale the data to each other so they have the same mean, uh, etc. So you normally do some um, mean subtraction normalization, uh, which basically looks like this. So it's one line, which is really nice. So you just do NP mean. There you go for your whole array. Uh, NP standard deviant also, and you're, you're done. Uh, and now it's centered around the, the, the zero about the origin. That's all you want to do. So that's your, your pre-processing. Uh, unless you do want to try some other steps and you may want to do some PCA whitening and stuff. If, you're, if your data is really noisy, this is maybe something you want to consider. So you do some at least a little bit of dimensional reduction uh, and you make it a bit less noisy. Um, so that's basically the code for that. Uh, also still pretty much simple. So you basically uh, stretch and squeeze the data into some Gaussian blob, basically, that becomes some isometric thing. Um, so how that looks for the images, once you have the original images and you, you do this kind of things, this is basically what you then instead feed into the network. So you feed into the network everything which deviates from the norm, because that's actually what makes sense. It's, it doesn't make sense to, to leave all of that. So it allows the network to kind of be more specific on the things it learns for your different classes you want to have. Um, um, and then important with these kind of things, of course, is to compute the statistics only on your training data, because that's what you're training on, um, but to do also apply it on all the data, because otherwise if you train it you know, on this kind of um, transformed data sets you also, and you test it on non-transformed data sets, of course it's not the same, so you, don't, uh, so you shouldn't forget that at least. Um, so that's about the most simple form of pre-processing. So once you've done that, there's, well, mainly speaking, there's three uh, architectures you can choose from. There's the deep, deep belief network, which is basically just a bunch of, uh, of, of neurons, or it's a bit based on um, restricted Boltmann's machines, if that says you anything, which you stack on top of each other. Um, introduced by Hinton in 2006, basically, as a way to pre-train neural networks. Um, so that's one, one choice, mostly used for different kinds of hierarchical data, a lot for, for audio data as well, for biomedical data. You have your recurrent neural networks, which are basically a form of a Hina Markov model, uh, which nowadays are mostly, you know, all the kind of adapted variants like long-term, short-term memory, which is mostly what revolutionized uh, natural language processing finally after, uh, and maybe since 2014, when everybody else was already doing cool stuff for four years, we were all still lagging behind until this came along. Um, and then there is the convolutional neural nets, which are basically used for, for, for image and, and uh, these kind of things. So a convolutional neural net basically looks like this. You have an input image. You have your convolutional layers. And what a convolution means, I will show in the next slide. Uh, and then you pull them, which is basically you make them to the same dimension again. Uh, and you have your, your output. And you have this in many, many layers. You want to do this as many layers as is possible. Um, so a convolution basically is you have an input image and you take small filters from that. You take a smaller crop. So you take small crops, but what you do is you kind of sum them together. So this is a, uh, a max convolution. And the actual convolved feature becomes a kind of um, abstracted sense of what you have in this image. So it kind of um, averages them or maxes them depending on what you're doing. So that's the, in the most simple form what you're doing with convolutional neural network. That's the trick. So if you understand that, then you implicitly know what all the fuss is about. It's actually relatively straightforward. Um, so then these were networks mostly used. It already was used for the first time in 1998 uh, for um, hand written character recognition. And 2012 is basically when it started to be adopted more uh, in academia and also for industry with some of the most new models. So the most large with maybe you know up to 17 or 20 layers deep by uh, Google Net, Google Net. Um, the winner of uh, ImageNet 2014, I think. The VGG, which is uh, from Oxford, uh, and then also some Microsoft um, audio recognition. Um, okay, we have to hurry up a bit. 
so basically training the network we do with in the most simple form basically like when we use something like lasagna this is it this is all the kind of code you need to start your neural network so this is the core um, so you assign you have your layer definitions in the beginning um, and then you have your parameters which you use so you can see the filters which are three by three in this sense or then two by two so that's the sizes of the crops you take uh, and then also the, the pooling size um, and then you also have your your uh, learning rate which you want to set or your momentum uh, your output, of course, what kind of lin uh, linearity you want to use, you know, the tongue hand or the sigmoid or the rectified <coughs> linear unit. And you have some different hyperparameters. And if you want to optimize your, your model or you want to try different things, you basically play around with this part, the architecture. That's mostly what you work with. The architectural part is, is what you try to see, see what it's doing on a smaller subset of your data to first try it. Uh, and also with the hyperparameters. So the, the things like the learning rate or when do you want to stop. Um, so once you do that and you start training your network, you get this kind of things. You get a, a loss function, which is basically approximation of the of the error. Um, and that's it. Then you're basically done and you keep running this for a while. Um, but if you want to debug this, um, you can do very simple in Lasagna. You basically get net train history and you have the train loss and the vetted loss. And you can basically just plot this you get something like this. So you have your, your loss curve, which you, of course, want to uh, get less over time. Uh, and at some point, most likely, the, the train and the, and the vetted loss, they will start separating from each other, and your model will start to overfit more. Um, and that's kind of why you want to stop your model, so your model doesn't overfit too much. Um, you can also get loss curves like this, which are very, very wide. So this mostly means that you're, uh, it's too noisy, and you want to lower your learning rates if you get <coughs> functions like this. Um, if it's also very wide, it also might mean you want to optimize, like basically uh, increase your bed size, so the kind of number of samples you do your testing on. Uh, and if they are too wide against uh, about each other, then definitely you also want to regularize your, your network more. So your, your network is basically too deep to make sense, so you have to do some more regularization or adapt your uh, network. But what you want is always, you always want a little bit of overfitting. If you don't overfit, your model is not deep enough, basically. So you want to have overfitting, but as small as possible. So once you regularize it more, um, then you get things. No, somehow it's gone, but it doesn't matter. Um, then it becomes smaller. Other things you can do is visualize the weights. So this is basically how you start your weights. It's just random noise, uh, and if um, after a while, um, your, your layers still look like random noise. There's, of course, something wrong going on. Or even more, after a while, when your, your layers still look like this, they're still very noisy. Uh, so you still have to do something um, to, to change it. So you want to basically adapt it and have more regularization um, until they look something more like this, where you have actually in the first layer mostly what you will look at, because it's the easiest to recognize. They have to be looking like edges. Um, so now we have an edge directly. And this is kind of the loop you do. You optimize, you regularize, you go back, you train it, and you keep going on until it uh, basically makes sense. Um, you can tweak your hyperparameters, which is really hard to do. Uh, and of course, you can't, really like a, you can't really do a grid search on your deep neural network, which has you know, up to millions and millions of parameters. So you, that's, that's not really possible, because you, know, you will go on for you know, millions of years. Um, you can do a random search by just having a, you know, less parameters to, to train. It's kind of being used and, and it works. Or you can do be easy in optimization, which is uh, nowadays uh, what is the most, uh, yeah, it looks like this works the best. Uh, and there's two uh, libraries for that also. Um, then you can also go on your data and you can say, well, I can transform my data in kind of meaningful ways. So especially for images, it's quite easy. You know, it's, it's a common technique to scale your images, to rotate them, um, etc. So you have, for instance, random crops, different contrast, flips, tints, uh, which look like this, which are also really easy to implement. Um, and this is, for instance, an example of uh, the Kaggle competition uh, for the data science plankton ball. Uh, so this is a lot of different kinds of techniques that you use for, for data augmentation, which is basically why one of the reasons why they probably won the, the competition, because it, it allowed them to basically, you know, triple, you know, make 100,000 more data than they would normally have. So they did this data augmentation in real time. 
Uh, other things you can do is drop out, which basically once you have again something way too, too wide between the training and the, and the vetted loss function, and this is your, your neural network, you can basically randomly um, switch off nodes, which allows the network to kind of adapt to particular parts and it becomes kind of overlapping. So instead of having a very specialized network where every node does one thing, multiple nodes will start re being a bit more redundant in what they're doing and you have a much more agile model. Uh, and it will look more like this. Um, so, of course, that's much better. You can do batch normalization, which I won't go into now. So that's one of the other tricks. Um, and finally, what I will show is how to win a Kaggle competition with only uh, two days of coding, um, which, of course, we're all interested in. That will be the end. Um, so this is all the different things you can do. But if you really want to be, uh, you know, not so smart about it. You just throw your models together. So you have 10, let's say you train 10 models. Um, and independently from each other, you can see the, the first thing to each other. You can see the, the, the error rate is kind of low until you start putting them all together. That's the, the final one where you take the average of all of them and you have a much higher, because they're all probably overfitted in some portion of the data. But if you take the average of all of them together, they all have grabbed at least some logic of your data. And together, they do a much better job. So it's kind of wisdom of the crowd instead of having one specialist. Um, so these are the different, if you take just the average, predict the mean by the model, or you just leave out one model, uh, the, the worst performing model, you get the best thing. Uh, and for one of the Kaggle competitions, what I've done is basically, this is also from a tutorial by uh, Daniel Nuri, where you train different specialists for different facial key points uh, stuff. Um, so these were three models. Uh, I trained with a little bit of different tweaking. Every model maybe took two days to train. So it's a relatively small model. It's still fitted on the G2 Amazon instance. So it's a quite small convolutional network and it didn't cost me too much to, to train in my free time. Um, but then taking all of these together, you get a much higher uh, or a much lower uh, root mean square error, which is this basically the amount of pixels you're off on a 48 by 48 image predicting the, the facial key points. Uh, and that was my, my famous glory to rising to uh, position one. Um, but then <laughs> machine learning systems can also be easily fooled. Uh, and that's one of the other uh, approaches taken in, in academia a lot. So we can predict, instead of on the image base, we can predict also classes on the pixel level. So we get this kind of um, saliency maps, it's called. So we have different classes on the, on the pixel level. Um, and then we can do our magic, so we know if we have a certain, let's say we take an input image, a police van, uh, and we also have an image, uh, an Egyptian cat, and we take the most meaningful pixels from the Egyptian cat, and we can, which basically is a bit like noise, that's the, the middle one, that's kind of the activation of the, the gradient from the, the, and we put that, push that in a, some smart way into the image. It still looks for humans as, an, uh, Im as a police van, but to the model now, it's an Egyptian cat. Uh, and we can do that the same for down there. We all know. And it looks a bit distorted because it didn't have time to do the nice, you know, whatever. The, the color space was a bit off. Uh, but now it's a goldfish. So once you see that logo somewhere on the internet, it's a goldfish. Uh, and there's other ways you can fool them. Basically, that they don't always perform it well. So they can be overfitted on particular features. So we have what the model there sees as leopards. And this is most likely what the models has learned to recognize. But once we then have a couch, which actually I think also a few days was tried you know, on a pre-trained model and all the existing commercial applications as well. And every one of them was off, like MetaMind or whatever, all the other ones predicted it all as a Jaguar and Panther. Uh, yeah. You got a question, if you want to get a question in before we finish. Yeah, this is it. So oh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, to uh, can we get the mic? Hey, uh, uh, so one thing I'm wondering, I always see um, a way of understanding what's going in, in inside the internal layers is through images and you can start to see 
different edges being detected and shapes being detected. And that mostly applies to images. But how do you get the similar sort of intuition when you're dealing with uh, NLP? Yeah, very good question. That's actually what my PhD is partly about. Uh, and it's not really, uh, I wouldn't have a good answer for that. <laughs> I mean, Im images, that's why I think one of the reasons why, why images are, are kind of taking off so much, because it's kind of easy to visualize. And the problem with language is that, that language, it's not raw, it's kind of, it's symbols, right, language. And it's, an, it's a representation already by itself, it's an abstraction. If we talk to each other, what we really say with our words is not really what we're saying. We we're saying all the kind of informed decisions which we have taken culturally and linguistically to, to understand what these symbols mean. So to have all of these models in your network model, well, Hendrik will tell a bit about that on his talk, how you still can get this kind of assumed context in your model with word embeddings. But uh, yeah, that's a, hard to, to visualize. Yeah. Thank you, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, when uh, a small child tries to learn something, it see one cat, two cat, ten cats, but not thousands of cats, and yeah. it be able to understand the difference between cat and dog, even with such small samples. Do yeah. you think that something is missing, uh, not only some uh, knowledge of the world of, of human, but, but something else is missing in this approach? Uh, when you trying to uh, compare it with brain, with human brain? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the neural nets, they're, they're extremely much more simple than, than the brain operates. The brain is much more complex. Like, neurons in the brain can take different kinds of... They're all kind of similarly doing the same thing at different layers, which is kind of interesting, but they're all still very different. There's a lot of different neurons there. Uh, and also the brain, it's insanely much more large than the largest uh, neural network, like thousands and thousands and thousands of times larger. So it's impossible to compute, you know, what is going on in the, actually in the brain. Uh, and then about the child learning things through examples. I mean, yeah, of course, you, human brains, they're, they're, you know, they can do so many tasks at the same time, while a neural network can only do you know, one or a few. So, so you can't really compare them in that sense. Um, so, it's, so it's different kinds of intelligence, if you want. They do really, really different things, and they also have very different representations. Um, and one of the kind of more philosophical aspects, which, which, are, which some people are kind of now um, developing further, is that you need embodiment. For, for intelligence. So you need to experience the world uh, to be able to understand it. So that's where robots and why maybe Google bought you know, these robotic firms uh, to be, be able to do that. Uh, and also, uh, what else I was going to say about this? Well, the children, they learn continuously still. You know, a neural network you train for two weeks and then it's off again. Well, if you're, you know, we humans, we train continuously. We're continuously learning new things. Uh, so I'm stealing time from you. Uh, let's uh, 